Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I am Dr. Loy Parks. I am the Leadership Development and Institutional Strengthening Specialist with the Caribbean Center for Development Administration, CARICAD. And we're all about transforming public services for the people of the Caribbean. And today's topic, it piques so many persons' interests. And thank you all for registering. Thank you all for being here. And for those who will listen the delayed recording, thank you also for listening in. And the topic, as you see there on the screen, leading the Gen Z generation. We want to have a, what we expect to be a very fruitful and insightful and enjoyable and engaging discussion with our panel of Gen Z public officers from around our member states. And we're going to be finding out about them and about the Gen Z generation. Who are they? What motivates them? Are they any different from another generation? But probably most importantly, how can we work with them successfully? That is what we are going to be exploring today. And so in case this is the first time you are joining a webinar at here hosted by CARICAD, a very special welcome to you. And we always have certain ground rules. We have these webinars monthly and it's part of our continuous learning and development networking strategy to help us as leaders, particularly across our CARICOM member states to continue to grow network and succeed as leaders. And so we want this to be a very useful learning opportunity, even this virtual space. And so we have a few ground rules to help us to do that successfully in the virtual space. Close all your software applications apart from Zoom, mute your various phones, remind your colleagues that you're unavailable. So then, you know, this is a my little learning hour. And so I want the opportunity to just lean in and to learn and to contribute as much as I sometimes internet connection can be a challenge when we're working in the virtual space. And so if you have an internet cable, it might be useful to plug that in. And so in terms of your participation, we invite you to use a chat feature when the time comes for um, Q&A discussion. We will allow persons to unmute and to make their comments, ask their questions. We just ask that you use a raised hand feature so that we can uh, you know, get you to, to unmute and to just to manage the flow of the discussion. And so we always like to ask, where are you joining us from today? And so would you be so kind as to put that in the chat? I am joining from Jamaica, right? Where are you joining from? She said, Nicole, Nicola, welcome from Antigua. Nisha from, um, man, the, 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 the things are coming in fast and furious. I see people from um, Nisha from Barbados, Vanessa from Montserrat. Hi, Vanessa. Devlin from also from Antigua. Bridget, hi, Bridget. We were, Bridget and I were communicating just yesterday from Trinidad and Tobago. Alana from Barbados. Sophia, hi, Sophia, one of our alumni. Joining from Barbados, Michelin, joining from Jamaica. Yes, another alumni, I see. Yet another alumni joining from Jamaica. JDF, Jamaica Defense Force. Sean Monroe, Deborah from Barbados. Karel from Antigua, Ar Karel, um, still with the ECCB, I believe, yes. Arita, another alumni from Guyana. Stephanie from Montserrat. Tiffany, another alumni from Bida. Sharice, in our current Leadership Development Program, or joining from Antigua. Avenis from St. Kitts, Diana. Hi, Diana. From Belize, a long time no see, yes. Av uh, yes, I said that. Joyan from Barbados, another alumni. Natasha from Antigua. Lynn, another Bajan alumni. Welcome, Cecilia, also from she says, you know, she's joining from the Nature Isle, Dominica. Hello. Yes, indeed. Hi, Cecilia. From Cohort 4, alumni Shauna from the Ministry of National Security, Jamaica. Welcome, Shauna. 
Kenut, another alumni from no Kenut, I know your minister's name has changed. It is very long, but he works with the transport portfolio in Jamaica. I like another um another Trini alumni. Tanika from Trinidad, Andrea from SVG, esteemed alumni from SVG, yes. Mary Shade from Trinidad, Lucy from Montserrat, Carol is confirming, yes, still with the ECCB, Tristia from BVI, Bay from Barbados, another alumni high Bay, Soyinka, Permanent Secretary, Department of Public Service in Jamaica, an esteemed alumni, and Guyana's board member for CARICAD, Ms. Soyenka Grogan, welcome. Tracy and Ricky from Jamaica, Alicia, my sister from another mother from Trinidad, an alumna as well, yes. Alicia, welcome. Cheryl from Ministry of Agriculture, Jamaica. Devlin is from Antigua. Yes, man, so we have a whole CARICOM affair going on and up in here. Fantastic. Hi, very welcome from the Barbados Workers Union. Workers, no, Barbados Workers Union, Credit Union in Barbados. Valerie, good to see you here in this space. And so I am curious because nobody put a gun to your head. You very voluntarily joined today. What are, oh my goodness, I must apologize for this error in my question. Let me correct that. And what I'm asking you is, what are you, what do you want to learn today? Why did you join this webinar? What are you hoping to learn today? And you can just type that in the chat. What are you hoping to learn today? What are you curious about? What piqued your interest? Why did you say, I looked at this topic and I thought, no, I really have to register for this thing here. I have some questions. And it's a good thing when you share that, it gives us an idea who we could serve you today, me and my Gen Z panel. So Malika wants to get more, in, more insights on what drives this group of employees, all right? So my panel, they want to know what drives you. Yes, um, how to motivate them, Avanis, how to learn, learn how to navigate working effectively with Gen Zs. Better insight. Um, Diana has a very young staff. She, her staff is from the Gen Z generation. So I want to learn more about what motivates them. And I like that, you know, Diana, because it's saying that you as a leader, as team leader, you are accepting that responsibility for learning more about your team so that you can be the best leader to them. So, fantastic. Valerie is... She wants to get into the minds of the Gen Zs. What do they value, for example? Kenut is saying he's quite aware that we're in the 21st century workplace and workforce and has Gen Zs as part of his team who wants to serve them better. Yes. Sean says, we have diversity in the workplace. We need different approaches. She wants to learn how to mentor, motivate, and to lead. Vanessa wants to know what makes them tick. Nisha wants to know, how do I enhance their teaching and learning experiences? Yes, as a facilitator myself, yes, I'm quite interested in that. How do I keep Gen Z engaged? Well, how do we learn from them? I like that perspective, Sophia, because not that they are only learn from others. We have something that we can learn from them. I, I, I admit I've sorted it out the drum the Gen Z generation. Carol wants to recognize that there is a generational divide yeah, ah, you know, I prefer to use the word generational diversity. It doesn't have to be a divide. Eh? And hopefully, if you're feeling like there is a divide now, maybe from the discussion, we'll find ways to make it far less a divide and more of a wonderful, positive diversity that we can tap into. Carol wants to understand the characteristics, motivations, get ideas on how to improve performance. Ah, Andrea says, why do they deviate from public service norms? Mm. Do you deviate from public service norms, Gen Zs? Let's hear about it. And we want to explore that a little more, yeah. Cecilia wants to learn how to get them under the change wagon. 
Ah, okay. All right. All right. All right. So many, many interesting reasons and many, many things people want to learn on this, in relation to this topic. Mary said she wants to understand how to work with Gen Z's to build and work with their communities. All right. Thank you all very much. So before we get into our topic today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about CARICAD in case you don't know. And we are a CARICOM institution created over 40 years ago. And we were created to support our member states and we serve 17 such in the area of public sector transformation. And what you see on the slide here represents a number of the types of services that we provide to our member states, as well as to regional organizations. And so these include capacity building around leadership development, we offer technical assistance in the area of human resource management and development, governance and policy development, strategic planning, results-based management, organization development, business process analysis, change management, monitoring and evaluation, just to name a, a few of those, all right? And so we are very much guided by our work, our work is guided rather by our Caribbean Public Service Charter. And what this charter does is create a unifying framework for public sector transformation across our member states. And so what you see here just represents the, uh, what we call uh, affectionately our charter house. And we really talk about the six pillars of public sector transformation, the foundation of which is a citizens oriented public service. That's what we're aiming for. And topped off by getting a public service that is responsive, results oriented, resilient, and it's very much uh, built on the principles of sustainability. You want to learn more about our Caribbean Public Service Charter, do visit our website at www.caricad.net. So, on to today's topic, leading the Gen Z generation. I am going to invite our three panelists to turn on their cameras. Uh, we are going to have our images spotlighted as soon as I finish. Um, introducing the three of them. Um, first up is Shaquana Vanderpool, and she is an administrative officer from the government of the Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands, that is. And she works with the Civil Registry and Passport Office. And she's currently um, in our leadership development program. Next is Nikita Turnbull. She is Deputy Chief Information Officer also with the government of the Virgin Islands. And Siobhan Miller is the male on our, on our panel. He's also in our leadership development program currently. He's a senior economist with the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce in Jamaica. And so, went to add Roger to spotlight um, us three so that you're seeing us up and close and center. I believe that's done. And so, now the three of them, well, I'm going to tell you their age groups, their ages, their specific ages, but they range from in the 20s to one is just a little bit over the 20, but they represent that useful generation, right? And you heard me introduce them and their job titles. So guess what? They are not junior people. Hello, these are people holding very serious, senior level positions in their respective public services. And so I want them each to just share a little bit about their career progression to date. So that I want people to know that, you know, people in this generation, they are competent, they are highly qualified professionals, and they are doing their thing. So let me kick off with Nikita, then Siobhan, then Shaquana. So Nikita. Hi. Hi. So just tell me, how did you become Deputy Chief Information Officer at your very, very young age, which shall not be mentioned? <laughs> okay. 
So I started um, with the government of the Virgin Islands as an information officer, which, which is basically a public relations officer at the government. So I, I loved communication. I studied advertising and mass communications in Florida. So when I came back, that was basically something that I knew I wanted to do because I had a government scholarship. So I had to work. Um, I had to be entered into government because that was the agreement of my scholarship and contract. So when I was given the opportunity to become an information officer, I loved it. I, I worked with many senior officers within the public service, um, ministers, working very closely with them. And uh, as the years went by, I actually exited the public service and I work as a marketing manager at a local hardware company. And that wasn't very fulfilling. So when the position of deputy chief information officer came up, I definitely applied and I got it. And in this position, I could make a change because I knew what it was to be an information officer and how my department operated. So in this position, I have more autonomy to do, make changes, firing, all those different things that I know I wanted as a young professional. And that is where I'm at now as Deputy Chief Information Officer. Right, thank you. And folks, note some of the things that she's sharing that we can explore a little further. What is it that she found attractive? Autonomy, being part of the decision-making process. You know, so these are some of the things, some of the motivators, eh? Let's go over to Siobhan. Siobhan. Hi, morning everyone. Good morning, hear you loud and clear. Hi. So after leaving university, after studying economics and statistics, I first got a job as an underwriter in an insurance company locally. And uh, thereafter, I realized that, you know, doing underwriting wasn't really for me, <laughs> even though it was for motor and other property and not necessarily going out to get clients and stuff like that. But then I saw a job um, offered by a USAID project, which was with, you know, the Ministry of Health, and they were focused on neurodevelopmental science and early child care. And I'm like, oh, you know, that would be nice to feel as if I'm making an impact in society. So I got that job as a data analyst. And whilst on that project, I was on other side projects where I conducted data analysis and uh, used that information to help inform senior officials. Then I became the senior economist at the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce around 2019. And thereafter, I also branched off to become the director of planning and performance when I embark on some training in strategic planning. Okay, fantastic. So notice some other things here. Both Nikita and Siobhan worked in the private sector and deliberately chose to work in the public, in their respective public services, right? So guess what? Our public services can attract young people. That's something I'm picking out from both of your responses. And again, um, what is Siobhan talking about? Doing interesting work, work that is using his skills, the opportunity for growth. You know, to talk about training and getting other opportunities for upward mobility, and also wanting to make an impact. Yeah, wanting to make an impact. Shakwana, tell us about your career progression. Hi, good morning again. So. I graduated from university in 2020s. So when I came back to the British Virgin Islands from the UK, I couldn't find a job because of the peak of COVID. So what I did, it, I had to do small jobs. So one minute I was a waiter, one minute I was a cashier, one minute I was um a accountant, next minute I'm a office assistant manager. And while I was in those roles, I realized that I kind of want to do more. I don't like being I don't like to, I didn't like having to depend on somebody. I wanted people to depend on me. So when I saw this role, I said I would be able to supervise a unit. That's why I applied for it, because I wanted to be able to motivate, supervise, lead, and guide 
those that um, are around my age. Hopefully, when time progresses, I'll be able to motivate and lead those that older, that's older than me, older than me. All right, thank you so much, Shakona. Right, and again, I what I like about Shakona's response, you know, we are flexible. The <laughs> Alice Sergeant the Shakona is. She was prepared to take on different roles until she found what she wanted. And eventually, you know, it's again that same recurring theme. You want more responsibility, you want more autonomy. Those are the kinds of roles that you're after. So let us explore that a little bit more. And so I want to delve into this question. What is it that you believe motivates not only yourself, but your peers, people who are in their 20s, very early 30s in the workplace context? Particularly, you talk about the public service. What do you think, what do they find motivating? And maybe conversely, what they don't like, what they find, what, they don't, what is demotivating as well. So let me go and say about Nikita Del Shavon and Shakwana. I think compensation is high on the list, very high on the list. But right there, laterally next to it would be purpose, which we all said, having some sort of say in what goes into what we do daily. I find that for me, when especially when I just came into the public service, I had so much creative liberty in the different campaigns that I created for the government. And that is what definitely motiva motivated me to stay. And that is what I love about the job that I have now. And without that, and I know that's what I was lacking in the private sector, um, I was completely demotivated. So along with compensation, which is very high for me, uh, a purpose is important as well and that is what keeps me going daily when i lose purpose is when i know it's time to move on um to something else that i can do and and give some sort of impact to in my community so you know i've heard people complain all they care about is money no we all need money but <laughs> not just money purpose purpose and i also hear autonomy Autonomy to be creative. That you know, it's not a free for all, but you are given that latitude to to bring your creativity to your workplace context. Thank you. Come on, let me hear your take on this. <laughs> Yes, I must concur with Nikita as it relates to compensation. You know, we know what we're worth and we won't necessarily settle for less than that. And we know what we can bring to the table. But I believe young professionals like myself and others in their 20s are often motivated by several factors, which include professional growth, you know, having that opportunity for skills development and career advancement. Our, our continuous learning is also good. And, you know, meaningful work, not only doing something that you are passionate about, but knowing that your work has an impact. And I believe we also value that work-life balance, you know, so it is very crucial for the workplace to really appreciate that and to support that balance and not necessarily push us to be working 24 seven. Um, also recognition and feedback on our work. I believe that's very important in order for us to develop and advance and ensure that we are continuously growing. But yeah, I think those are some of the areas I think that motivate us. I agree with um, Chef Bon. I was just, just going to talk about rewards and recognition because as Gen Z, we like, I don't want to say we like to be the spotlight, but we like to um, be told that we're doing the right thing and that motivates us to do more. Um, yeah, that motivates us to do more re re rewards and recognition. Yeah. yeah, good performance feedback. How am I doing? Yeah, folks, and that's free. <laughs> you know, and so I would ask, so many of you who in the comments earlier you said you know you lead people in the gen z generation you know to what extent are you giving them feedback on their work to what extent do you get them to understand the purpose that they're working towards that are not just a cog in the wheel but do they have you painted for them the bigger picture of 
why, the why we are here and why we're doing this. All right. So um, I want to follow up on something that um, you've all kind of shared in these last responses here. And it is that Gen Z, I think this is a little different from previous generations to some extent. They typically have an awareness of what they're worth. And they have an aware, a great awareness about work-life balance and striving for that. And because the truth of the matter is, I don't think previous generations necessarily, especially people in, you know, I forget what my generation is. I'm going to be 50 next month. So anybody can remind me what that generation is, right? Gen X. Right. And definitely the generation before that, we um we just work in 24-7 and have the doctor bills to, to prove it. Eh? Um that's a problem whole other is you know testimony I can share it another time. What is it then? What do you think would made it what is it about maybe your upbringing or exposure? that makes you more confident about saying, look, I know I'm worth this. Hey, no, I really believe in work-life balance. I, I believe in working hard, but this, you want me to be on call every day of the week? If you want to call me at night? No, I, I set boundaries here. What is it that caused you? Cause I think other people had those problems before, you know, but they didn't speak up like this generation, you know? They didn't understand their worth and were prepared to vocalize it the way your generation, I see, are willing to do. And I don't think that's a bad thing, by the way. But what, what do you think? Where does that come from? I believe it's, um, this generation is also more educated than mm -hmm. other generations, but also we're more self-aware. So you would hear things from this from people like us, people like us um, would say, oh, I'm overstimulated. Like you've never, I've never heard any other, like at least my parents refer to things saying, oh, they're overstimulated or um, like, you know, they, they need a mental break and things like that. So that self-awareness, I think is what makes us know, what makes us know that we are worth a little more along with our education. So that is what I feel it is, the education, going to school a lot longer in this generation, you find that there are persons with, with masters at the, instead of associates back in the past. So I know that if you go to school and it costs $60,000 and you come home and you're only making $30,000, it, it, it's not equivalent. <laughs> so, you know, and we also have more bills. So, and the cost of living is a lot higher. Higher. So a lot of those things are, are the things that we put into perspective that make yeah. us realize that, okay, we are worth, worth more, we know a lot more, um, where we think we know a lot more, that's, that is what other generations would say, yeah. but <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that is my opinion on it. Okay, I might I add that, yes, we did, you know, spend a, long, a longer time in school. So we, we know our history and we know slavery existed. And I believe that we are anti-oppression. So we tend to speak out a bit more and we know that, you know, a lot of things mimic modern slavery. So we are we are going to speak out no matter what. Some may use wisdom while others don't. But um, like Nikita said, we have more bills and we are a bit more driven because we usually set goals mm -hmm. and, you know, we tend to want to always achieve our goals. So we would definitely push ourselves to, um, to just go above and beyond that boundary in achieving our goals. And standard of cost of living is... It's way more expensive. It's way more expensive for us to get a house than it was for our parents. It's way more expensive for us to buy a full set of groceries than it was for our parents. So I think those are truly some of the, the factors that really push us to speak out more and not settle for less. Well, I agree with um, Siobhan and Nikita because another thing I would like to add is 
we now have the internet. We always had the internet, but now Gen Z, we know how to use the internet. If we want to figure out something, we just Google it. And now we have like social media, like Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. We're seeing perspective from different ages. So we could gather upon what we think about what was happening back then. I hope we could change it now due to the internet. And that's what motivates us because we see how things were back then. We're actually using our mind now and saying like, hey, I see this is how it is. This way it was back then. I don't want that to be my situation now. Cause right now, I'm not too sure if it's the same as um everywhere in the Caribbean, but right now in the British Virgin Islands, there's a lot of um older staff and they're just in the same position they've been in for like 10, 20 years. I know I don't want to be in the same position for 10, 20 years. So I can, what would I do? Go on the internet, see if I could do my master's online, continue learning new things, I could continue growing. No, indeed. Thank you. No, just want to go to the chat because some people have chimed in here. And I think there's some very useful comments. So Cheryl says, no, the older generation were afraid. They were fearful of speaking up because they had a fear of losing their jobs. You know, and I think that is in large part. And so, I, if, I mean, while I'm not of the Gen Z generation, I can think of my own father who... I can remember him having conversations with me. He said, I put up with this and that in my work, you know, in my day. I raise you not to put up with it, you know? You know, it was drilled into my, me and my siblings' head, you know? We're not going to be fearful and all this kind of thing. And Carl said, I feel that there are similarities with the mindset of the Gen Z and younger millennials like herself, yeah? And she says, um... Gen Z were told in school that they have rights and as such, they're more outright and more opinionated. Yeah, because I, I, I can remember even for myself, even though I am from Generation X, yeah, my father was very, very deliberate. And a lot of our parents, you know, we might complain, but we raised you also, <laughs> yeah. Gen Z speak out, they're not afraid to change jobs. That's another thing. Um, and they're not afraid to work in different countries. And with the with the advent of the internet and what happened in the pandemic, you know, realize you don't even necessarily have to go to a next country. You can stay where you are and work in three different countries at once, you know? Um, and your generation understands that. Avanis says, I think the Gen Zs are encouraged as children to express themselves. There's the same um, thought being expressed here. Um, whereas the older generation, we were told to hush, not to speak. Certain expressions were just not tolerated. Children were to be seen and not heard. And that has actually changed. Let me see other things here. Yeah, Kaylin is agreeing. You know, the, the older generation felt they were just lucky to be in a job. Um, Lydia says, it's important for, for the older generation, Gen X, that's my generation, to have a sense of job security because we had dependence, yeah? Um, Bridget says, I want to add that some Gen Zs are also benefiting from the advice, yes, from their parents. Exactly, Bridget. You know, um, you know, the parents said encourage, you know, their children take advantage of the opportunities that they did not get. You know, and so they're saying, no, you have more opportunities. Capitalize on them. Take advantage of them. Don't be like me. <laughs> you know. All right. So. And I see more comments coming in. Great. Let me go to the next question. I'm going to start with Shaquana this time and then Siobhan and then Nikita. So the question I'm asking is this. Um, what assets, what particular skills, um, competences, whatever you know, nomenclature you want to give it, what do you think that the Gen Z bring to work organizations? And how do you think organizations can truly tap into that? Is it that which, you know, the Gen Zs bring? So what I believe that Gen Z brings to the organization is a new perspective. As we stated before, that we grew up with the internet. So we learn a lot of things, especially when it comes to culture. Because every culture has their own perspective. And now that we have the internet, we get a little grasp of every culture and how we want to adapt to that culture to bring more efficiency and effectiveness to the organization. So we bring a new perspective. New I see new things. When I just when I first started working here, I 
um, realized that something in the front by the cashier moved a little bit too slow. So what I did, I made a drive for the cashier so they don't have to keep coming back to the visa unit to be getting stuff from us. They could just get it from in front where they at, where they are at. So the Gen Z bring new um new perspective and they bring new eyes so they can see uh where they could fix problems where other people won't see that there's a problem. Right, fantastic. Siobhan, we're in here. Yes, I must concur. And we are very much tech savvy. So outside of using the internet, I mean, the older generation tend to look to us for all the technological fixes, specifically myself in the office. I have to be reminding them that I don't work in ICT. But um, we're also very creative and innovative. And uh, I think we we also push for diversity and inclusion and we're very much adaptable. So if there are any change, we can quickly adapt and add value and, uh, you know, operate in this very fast paced world. Nikita. I agree with all of those things. I was going to say a little bit of those because this we're a digital, we're digital native. So we, as soon as we came out, it was a phone. Everything we know is from the internet or technology. So I feel that if government would transition into automizing everything technically, um, that would be one way to tap into the skills that Gen Z has to offer, um, as well as adapting things that now are becoming an issue like artificial intelligence. Gen Z has a lot of information on how we could use it effectively and efficiently to make sure that the work that we do is done quickly and without wasting time. I think we know how to do things quickly without wasting time. We, we not cut corners, but we know how to effectively produce work um, for the government, which makes us, again, a great asset. Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Fantastic. And the comments are coming. I am really liking how they are, our audience is interacting via the chat. And so um Joyan says she's from she's from the Gen X. She said she loves interacting with Gen Z's. Myself too. I can relate to what she's saying because you know you're not as not necessarily as tech savvy. And you're like, hey, these are the people who know and help me navigate. I can learn so much from them and so the other thing is that their thinking is, tends to be broader you know and if not broader it's really different so you bring that diversity as well to you know as we try to navigate things like how do we you know make public policy changes etc um there's a question that was in the chat earlier and, it, and i'm going to pose that question to all of you now i'm going to start with shakwana and go around the rounds and the question is, I mean, the reason why this topic is so topical, you know, is because we are now in a world where there are some countries where the pension age has been abolished or the pension age has gone up higher. It's just no 68, I believe, in Barbados. So, and even so, there are even people who are older than that in the workplace. So it's the first time in maybe the last 50 years we have so many generations working in the same workspace, right? And so it, it is an opportunity for, you know, tapping into that diversity. It's also an opportunity for conflict, let us face it. And so the question I want that is posed, and I think it's a very good question is, how do you interact with older employees in the workplace? Um, do you take advice from them? How, how does it work? What are some of the pros and the cons and the issues that you navigate as you interact with older workers? So for me, when I started working, I was 22 years old and as I came with a senior position. So I had a difficult time trying to communicate with the older workers. So they told me that like they felt that I was going to, was going to take that job or I came in pompous like I ready to do the work and all those stuff so it was a bit difficult for me but now what I what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to listen to them more so we could work together because I know for older people it's hard to change their mindset so instead of changing the mindset 
I'm going to just sit down and listen to them and try to understand what they're saying so I could at least try to make a plan for us to work together as a team. So that's what I um what I so that's what I'm doing with this older staff here. So it's a bit different with older staff. Yeah. So the power of deep active listening is a critical skill that you have to bring to you know navigating those workplace relationships. Thank you, Shaman. Let me hear your perspective here. Yeah, I am. I believe. <laughs> I believe I was not that, not really challenged per se with the older staff, even though I manage persons that were at least twice my age. Um, so it would be to be open, open-minded, um, actively listening to what they have to say. And it's a two-way street of communication. So yes, you may be proposing something. However, I have a counter and make clear recommendations on next course of action. And when it comes on to personal, of course, you know, they have many years ahead of us, so they have more wisdom to share in that sphere. But when it comes on to the work, it depends on the specialty or the topic at hand. You know, we do give and, and take at the same time. So it was pretty flexible on my end. Fantastic. Nikita. Working with all the staff, that, especially that you have to supervise, is extremely difficult. Um, so listening, listening and understanding is one of the key things that I had to do. And sometimes, especially dealing with a problem or tackling a new idea, what I found beneficial about the older persons within my department is that sometimes they knew they know the things that didn't work and that was important to know so that we didn't do the same mistakes over and I think that is something that sometimes we neglect to realize being younger that sometimes it's just listening and, and making sure we don't make the same mistakes constantly and we have this saying here if you don't know where you come from you don't know where you're going so you don't know how how far or what what things you already did <laughs> to now know what we can do and what we actually should do moving forward. But working, working with the, the senior persons within my department, I find that, uh, well, for me personally, it wasn't, it, although it was difficult being an authority and being younger, after I gained respect, it became easy. And I think that is all it was. Um, just they want to make sure you know what you're doing so that they can follow. And I think because I was young and coming into a senior position, I had to prove that I knew what I was doing for us, for them to then, for, for them for me to lead them effectively. Um, but yeah, listening and just gaining respect. Yeah, may I also add, sorry, she, Nik Nikita, touched on ver something very near and dear to me, which is to not make the same mistake twice. So I tend to learn from the older folks, you know, what were some of their mistakes and how I cannot make that mistake. And if I do fall, I would now know, you know, how to recover from it. So it's based on their expertise and mentorship. And she did say it rightfully. At the moment you gain respect and the moment they know that you know what you're doing, everything changes. No, so true. Um, being competent is important. You know, um, if you want to gain the trust, of, and it's not unique to the Gen Z by any means. It is just generally trust, the two components of trust, it's character and competence, right? And so if you prove yourself to be somebody of good character, and in fact, you are competent, that is how you gain trust, all right? And trust has to be gained. It's not an inherent right. It has to be earned. And the other thing too is that listening to each other, that listening is considered one of the highest form of respect you can give to another. And respect begets respect. You know, I'm not sure when using the word begets, but you all understand it, right? Um, you know, you show respect to others, they will in turn show respect to you. And it's also what I'm hearing from the three panelists here, it's recognizing what is it that each person brings to the table? 
right? So, yes, I bring something, but the other person brings something as well. And it's honoring that and tapping into not just their strengths, but my strengths, and we bring them together. All right. So there are lots of comments continuing in the chat. Um, so there are lots of people are saying, and I feel so good. They love Gen Zs. They love working with them. They like the fact that they're better with technology. They can learn so much from them. They are broad thinkers. People love that about you. But, and one person here is saying it, and um, to be honest, I've heard many people say this. They cannot understand why you don't dress as you ought to when you come to work. Now, I don't know if it is true of these people here. However, maybe you have seen it. You know, you have seen those skirts that are a little too tight, the pants that is just a little too tight, and this is just men and women, you know. Um, the guy is wearing the pants, then it's, it's quite above the ankle to show off the very colorful, clown-like looking socks, um, you name it. You know, the split that looks like a U way up near to their posterior. I've seen, we've seen it all. And we've all sort of said, oh dear. <laughs> we're being honest here. We're being honest. So tell us about dress code because we can also get too uptight about dress code too, I think. But let's hear your perspective. And then you can start. I, I, I have a love-hate relationship when it comes to the government's dress code. When I came into the public service as a creative, now I studied advertising and communication. So when I was in Florida and for my internship, dress code was never an issue. Granted, it was in the public sense, public sector, not the, I mean, in the private sector, not the public sector. So they, just, they had no rules. So when yeah. I came back home and basically our deputy governor at the time, um, it was very strict pantyhose, no open toes, skirts below your knee, um, heels. To me, craziness. You always had to wear a jacket in the heat. And I found it very stifling to my creativity. And it did nothing for my productivity or anything that I had to offer with my skills, the way I dress didn't matter. However, what I can respect that there is a place and time um, for professionalism. And that is what I think needs to stay. Now, what we decide as professionalism is what needs to change. Now, do I always need to wear a jacket to look professional? I don't, I don't think so. I don't always need to wear a jacket to, to look professional. However, yes, my skirt should be at an appropriate length. I don't think it should be all the way near to my bum. I agree with that. However, um, there needs to be some sort of balance and some sort of shift in the way we, we think of what of who professionals look like and what they and what they wear and things like that. Because again, we're in the Caribbean. It's hot. I've I've never seen I've never seen um people in the desert wearing jackets because they're out to a business event. Um, no, you could wear a nice linen long sleeve shirt and still look professional with a nice a nice pants if you're a maid. And the same for female, you could still wear a nice dress, still a bit loose fitting, and, and it's okay. So it's just the way, when it comes to dress codes in the public sector, I think we could be a little more lenient on, on the younger generation and just give them some guidance. But stifling them to put them in a box on how to wear is counterproductive, is demotivating. It's sometimes you can't, they can't even afford the clothes that you want them to wear because you're not even paying them enough. So it, it's just a balance on, on how we can all be professional in the workplace and still be comfortable. I'm discussing a lot of what I like here, here. I, yes. I I don't get the three-piece suit for men. I, I cannot get it at all. <laughs> yes. Yes. Shaman, you want to chime in and then Shaman? Well, Nikita touched on everything that I was going to say because I personally, I'm not going to wear no three-piece suit every day to come to work. I have made the conscious decision to not wear a tie unless I need to. 
and that was done about two, three years ago. And as it relates to really and truly the dress code and how some persons carry themselves, where I don't have that concern or issue, I'm normally commended for how I dress in the workplace. I believe it starts at the school because most of us here in the Caribbean, we wore uniforms in, in schools. So if you start there with really instituting the dress code at the school level and try and, <laughs> you know, create some form of reform as it relates to the tight pants and the short skirts, which has been an issue in Jamaica for many years, we will see a bit of change in the workplace. And of course, a major factor is the cost for, um, for the correct office wear. But even though we now have the internet and commerce is a bit more um, easier, we can get clothes cheaper online. However, you know, some persons have challenges fitting into certain clothes and they have to be made. Mm -hmm. And that is costly to have, you know, your pants tailored. It's, it do cost. Yeah. For Shakwana chimes in, a lot of people are in the chat like, yes. The time is so hot. These are ridiculous dress codes. Uh, and in fact, this whole thing about wearing suits and so on is really, uh, it's a very European concept. A European, an old European concept, I might add, you know, because I don't think they are even adhering to that, those kind of standards, no. Shakwana, let's hear your um your take. Yeah, so Nikita Shabon basically touched on everything that I have that I wanted to say, but the main thing that um one one other thing that I want to add on is as I say the money. Um for most Gen Z hair, we don't get paid as much to be buying good clothes that can last long. So for me I'm six foot tall, six feet tall. So you know the yeah. the skirts them and the dresses them ain't gonna be reaching me um below my knees. And then after a few washes they can rise up and stuff. So like it's about money. We don't have the money to keep buying new clothes, especially clothes that didn't last long. But one thing that I would like to address is the same thing Nikita touched on, creativity. We're young. Most of us went away for school to America, to the UK. We saw their culture. They have bright colored hair, tattoos, piercings, but still have office jobs. But we can't do that here. We need to, we need to adapt more to the first world countries a little bit, especially when it comes to office wear. Because for me, I have 13 tattoos. I try my best to cover them, but sometimes, like, as I say, it's hot. I can't be wearing a jacket every single day. But also, there aren't any rules talk about tattoos in the manual, but some older staff might have a problem with it. So I always try my best to cover it up as much as I can. So we need to adapt more to force world cultures when it comes to office wear. And to add to someone's um... own... The tattoos and hair color. Under this hair piece, my my hair is orange, reddish orange. And when I dyed it full orange, when I came back into the pub, I purposefully did it right before I came in back into the public service. My I dyed my hair reddish orange, and surprisingly, no one had anything to say. And that is just to show that I guess there is a shift. Um, in the way because before when I came into the public service that would that would not have been acceptable and I recognize that there is a shift so I am thankful for the little win that I get I know I, I may not get away with dyeing my hair purple which I want to do but at least there is some sort of shift in the public service that I can recognize that persons can see that the color of my hair does not say um, whether or not I can effectively do my job because it doesn't, it doesn't say that. Okay, thank you so much. And folks, keep your questions coming. And there are a couple of other questions that I, I saw in the chat. So one question has to do, and they're asking the new panel members to respond to this. And it's from Bridget and Bridget was saying, um, discuss the difference between being productive versus just always 
being on their phone. No, I'm wondering if perhaps we ought to ask Bridget just to maybe elaborate a little bit more. My suspicion is that I sort of have seen where um, persons tend to be on their phone a lot at work and the, and you find that that becomes a distraction sometimes for them. Some other people are talking to them, they're not hearing, they're not paying attention to certain details. So uh, uh, it may be along that line, but what are your own perspectives? Um, I would like to say something. When it comes to Gen Z product productivity and the usage of cell cellular devices, I would like to add with Gen Z, well, the Gen Z is in my office, we do our work really fast. We um, with that being said, we have a lot of free time once we do our work. So my coworker and I, similar in visa, our work permit is sixty five words per minute. We type really fast. We could do about fifty visas a day, and then what we do? What do we do for the rest of the day? We just relax for a bit. So with productivity, I'm not too sure if it's safe with all the offices, but for our office. Once we start and we come in to do our work, we do it and we finish it really fastly when it comes to that and using our phones. We're really efficient when it comes to doing our work and having enough time to do whatever, whatever else we need to do. That sounds like you don't have enough work to do, but <laughs> that might give you some more work, you want. <laughs> no, but thank you for sharing that perspective. Come here, Shana, go ahead. Uh, but... <laughs> I mean, I understand this whole concept that, you know, we're always on our phone, but oftentimes we're doing the work on our phone. Because if you come into a mm -hmm. meeting and mind you, what you have to say, yes, whilst it's important, I hear it, I've received it, but I also have my work to be done. So I'm either texting the other teammates, giving guidance on that, or um, actually doing research that is required for me to complete the work when I get back to my desk. Also, um, my principal director, I recall one time, did say to me, oh, boy, Siobhan, you shut me out. And that was because I had on my earphones in the office and he was calling me or speaking generally because we work in an open concept. And I'm like, yeah, I need to focus so I can get this paper to you at the agreed time. Mm -hmm. So I would put in my earphones just to shut out the office because sometimes, you know, the cross the cross talk can become overbearing. But I think there needs to be a little bit of leniency and there also needs to be some form of understanding as there is a time and place so as to when we can use our devices because we are always going to be connected. If we don't have internet on our phones and if we can't you know, quickly talk to somebody, the world is going to end for us. For me, I think the productivity, I'm, I'm torn on this topic now that I am supervising staff. Um, because I do have a very young staff member that um, always, he's always on his phone. However, I haven't engaged him because he's very productive. He does his work quickly, so fast. So I do recognize that, yes, phones could be very distracting. The only time I have a problem with phone would be in a meeting. And if you're not taking notes, on your phone and usually only one person when we take minutes they aren't they're doing it on their phone but if you're just on your phone and you're not paying attention um paying attention that is distracting however i do realize that there is a mental overload in my office because we do deal with a lot of time sensitive stuff so when we do have a downtime you would notice that persons are probably on youtube watching something or on their phone just mentally taking a break and that's needed again in my field of work um where we have to do a lot of editing videos or graphic design that that creative break needs to happen in between so i'm torn on it i feel yes it can be distracting however i do realize that sometimes it may be just a break that someone's taking and maybe i should find something more engaging at least for my younger staff to do that would keep them occupied all day because obviously they're doing the work like what Shaquana said quickly too quickly right whereas my older staff that that was there a couple of years ago it would take them all day they're doing it 
in three hours to know what else um do we do or what else can we give them and not giving them more work doing rewarding them with more work for doing good work but what can i do now to keep them engaged gainfully engaged on the workplace or making sure that if they're on youtube that they are taking that time um to do some training and watching educational videos instead something like that yeah. um to, with um nikita from when I was supervising passports, it's the same thing. They do their work really fast and they will go on their phone. So not that I know that it's new staff, what I would do when I see that they're on their phone, I will train them and show them something new to do because it's the same it's the same in our office. We have multiple things we could do in the office from marriages, deaths, boards, passports, visas, nationality. So I always try to train them on something else to do in the office if I realize they finished their work already. And it's just there's nothing else to do instead of just being on the phone for the whole time. Depending on what time it is as well. So that's something else that you do with the staffs. And and to add to that, sorry, <laughs> that's a time you could probably use for cross training. So like she said, maybe now my admin officer could see well how how the process is in my production unit. And that there would then be the opportunity for upward mobility and succession planning. Because now they're so good at what they're doing. What now can I give them um, to do that would prepare them for the next role in their succession path? The other thing that struck me in all of what you're saying too is that, and this is not necessarily only about Gen Z's, by the way, but if you find that you have team members who are much more productive, they're far more efficient. We should be paying attention to what is it that they are doing. The chances are they have found a way of working that the other team members may not know. And so how do we learn from that? And so we could adopt that as that becoming you now the new standing operating model. And therefore we you know recognize if we have created efficiencies, what then, how do we then expand the role of the office? How do we create even more efficiency? How do we add, find ways to add even more value? Be more innovative in what is it that the team has to do more broadly, you know? Um, I, I think it's, it, when you see people operating more efficiently, it's an opportunity to upskill everybody on that team and to raise the productivity of the team to a different level. Thank you. Now, another um, question that has come up, and one person is saying, look, um, so you guys are these wonderful, highly productive professionals, people that are in your generation, but there are some who, um, yes, they might have a first degree, but they don't seem to be using it. They are quick to say they don't know. You know, you ask them something they don't know, they don't seem to. Yes, they have access to technology. They don't seem to be using it. You know, um, they're kind of just hands at the side. They're waiting to be told what to do. They, they don't necessarily, you know, they have the degree. You know, they should know certain things. But somehow they're just not bringing that to the table. How do you deal with that? Mentorship. Um, that's where we, we include and appreciate the older generation. I find that being digital native as well, communication is what, la is what, is what is lacking because everything is communicated over the phone, texting, um, so just mentorship sometimes is not that they don't know or, or maybe they're just afraid. Especially in a workplace, it is a scary place when you enter. So I find that if sometimes I have new staff and I pair them with older staff, then like, you know, those things like, I don't know, telling them, no, you know, and giving them encouragement and making them feel that opinion does matter. Cause I think that's the issue as well. That it's not that they don't know, they probably are free to stay. And then, and that's a two edged -ed sword because the Gen Z is very fearless, but I find maybe not as fearless in the Caribbean. 
in the in the states now i find they're very much more outspoken than in the caribbean i'm not sure why but it could be again that seen and not heard um that we still may hear from our older parents but i find if the two generations just come together and there's some sort of mentorship that we would you would see a solution to that issue all right thank you for sharing that perspective Siobhan and Shaquana, go ahead Siobhan. uh so i would say that i had one encounter with that with a younger employee who was about 20 years of age at the time and um, I believe what I had done was to have a little one-on-one, -on -one, find out what is the problem, uh, you know, why are you not driven or motivated to be here? Because, you know, we employ you to use your brain. We employ you to think. And I believe with the use of the internet, it can be used to the betterment of the job because everybody know that there is the University of YouTube and the University of Google everything is there you can access it so it's just how you really use your time and just remind the staff that you know your opinion matter your voice matter so ensure that you use it and use it for good and uh, i believe <laughs> i'm more of like a tough love so once i i see this the, the issue going on more than three times I'm just going to rough you up. And of course, Nikita did touch on a very important point, which is our senior. So our senior will give us guidance as to how to deal with the matter. And if necessary, I would call on my senior to address the matter for me, because of course, they would have had more years of experience managing staff and dealing with issues like this. So they will be better equipped and may, may have a gentler touch in motivating the staff than I would. Yeah. Yes, I was thinking about a question for a long time because the more I think about it, I think about personalities and the way the person was raised because Say we have two staff members, both of them act the same way. They don't know, they're not saying much, they're not using a degree. One staff member, they're probably just happy to get a job because they want money, but it's not something that they want to do. The other staff member probably just shy and just don't want to talk or say much. So I'm yeah. thinking about it and what I would do, I would, as Siobhan said, I would sit down and talk to them, right? So say the first staff member, the one that's just here for the money, I would talk to them and say, what do you really want to do? I would set up some guidelines, help them find a job or help them with their, um, but just something like, just help guide them on what they actually want to do. Cause you know how it feels to be in a workplace where it's nothing that you studied for. So mm -hmm. yeah, I understand that for the, the say the, um, the employee that's just shy, talk to them and try to get them out that bubble because at the end of the day, they need to show us that they know what they're learning, that they can make more um that they can make more effort in improving the business and all of that. So I just feel like not all of them probably don't care, but we need to try to figure out the root of the problem first before assuming that they just don't care or so forth. Agreed, agreed. You know, um Every individual, yeah, we're talking about Gen Zs, but everybody's an individual. And it's really about tapping into who are they and getting to the root of what's happening with that person. The other thing too, we assume because people have access to technology that they know how to use the technology. When I say the how, I don't mean the kinds of, you know, I mean, do you really know how to use the technology to increase your productivity how you use the technology to add value to your work to create efficiencies and so on i think that's an assumption we make that people know these things they may not even though they might be quote unquote tech savvy right and so we do have to um, make sure that people actually know how to use the technology right in the way that we want them to use it. All right. So Siobhan, I said it's a tongue-in-cheek thing here. Siobhan, please tell us how a Gen Z roughs you up 
No, he was saying he roughed them up. Nobody roughs up Siobhan. He is the one who does the roughing up. <laughs> correct, correct. <laughs> and I mean, oftentimes I may come off, you know, a bit strong personality, but um, I believe my research officers, when they just came in, you know, fresh from university and a bit more reserved, I would have pushed them to come to my office every single morning with five affirmation and I have them repeat the affirmation until they believed it. And now they are more than expressing what they had affirmed two years ago. They have exceeded the output and done excellent work and are very um, vocal in the work environment. So I have my methods. That is method. I love it. I love that one. I love that one. And so we are just about at the end. I do notice a number of people joining who I know their names. I know they're from Jamaica and they've forgotten that Jamaica is one hour behind the Eastern Caribbean. So don't worry. This webinar is recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So while we close out, I want each panel member to just share one short parting thought. What is it that you want our audience to leave with about leading the Gen Z generation? What would be your parting thought? Let me start with Traquan and then Siobhan and then Nikita. Okay, it's just something short. With Gen Z, we don't want to be heard. We want to be listened to. There's a big difference. And I feel like people in Caribbean don't know it. there's a difference. I want to know that you're understanding what you're saying. And of course, I'll let you know that I understand, I understand what you're saying. Because it's like... Someone um mentioned this in the com in the comments. I can't remember what it said, but basically, oh, they mentioned about having a memo type the same way for like one to two for ten to twelve years, but somebody came and wanted to make a difference and they don't allow that. We need to change that. We need to let the newer um staff and Gen Zers to make changes, be able to talk about things that they see that can make um that they can change instead of shutting them off and say, well, you're young, just starting working here, you will understand. We need to actually sit down and understand and listen to what they're saying, what we're saying. Shalom, your parting thought. Yes, I must say that there is a major difference between micromanaging and guidance. And guidance would help us way more than micromanaging does where we feel as if you know we're being bombarded with all this anxiety to meet expectations rather than guiding us to get the result that is required big difference between micromanagement and giving guidance i love it nikita like i said in the beginning giving them some sort of autonomy and giving them a chance to make a difference, having a space, you would see that Gen Zers do have a lot to offer and that they do know what they're doing, especially those coming straight out of university. Even though they're young, age doesn't really matter for this generation. They're highly educated, highly qualified, and do have some experience that will benefit the workplace. So giving them a chance and giving them Autonomy, I've seen this with my permanent secretaries now, giving interns, um, having them on panel, just like myself, a lot younger to stay and talk about what they do in the world. That makes them feel good. It's a part of the, the reward, a part of the benefit to making them feel like they have some sort of purpose in the workplace. Right. Chevron, Chacon, and Nikita, it has been an absolute delight. I really want to thank you. And I see lots of persons in the chat thanking you. I mean, you make us feel good. Yes, the next generation has got this. Thank you for sharing your experiences, your insights so transparently and openly and willingly. And all the very best in your endeavors. And so as we come to the, the, um, the end here, we just want to share um, just a couple of announcements. And so the call for applications are now open.
for Caracas Leading Change Workshop. That's a four-day virtual workshop taking place in January 2024. Um, if you are involved, your organization, your team, involved or about to embark on major organizational change and a lot of that is happening, you will find that you will, this workshop will give you many, many tools that are transferable to practically um, engage and lead your change initiatives successfully. You want more information on that, please visit our website at caracad.net, email us at info at caracad.net. So we are going to invite you just to complete our very short evaluation poll. Let us know how you found the, um, the webinar today. You'll see the link to the poll in the chat. It is there in the chat now. So we invite you to just complete that for us. We believe here at Caraca that feedback is a gift and we always want to know how to do it better and better. So continue to follow us on our social media pages, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, visit our website, sign up to receive our emails on a regular basis. And so with that, I want to wish you all the very best for the rest of the day and for the rest of the work week. Until our next webinar, next, November, next month, November, all the best. <laughs>